about uh, construction on a new Denver skyscraper, which is uh, this building here. It's uh, something in the vicinity of about a million, I think a million square feet, uh, maybe more, actually. And uh, what, what's interesting is that this case is clearly, this project is clearly linked to uh, the opening of the Denver uh, Union Station project last year, one year ago, and uh, the booming economy in uh, Colorado and Denver is reflective of many things, but of course, I think the Denver Union Station project is part of a wide array of different factors that are demonstrating this support for this booming economy. And so I want to talk to you today about the Denver case. It's a very different case. Um, how do we get down here? Sorry. So the Denver case study. Oh. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Wait, wait, wait. I forgot to put this in here. Sorry. and old transportation system. You saw that network and you saw how refined it was. To, uh, Stockholm has uh, many decades of experience in refining its system. Uh, likewise, these are denser uh, settlement areas. And the reason why I chose Denver, not because I live there, okay, not because I live in this region, but because it's the most interesting story in the United States right now, of a, t a TOD project, and that's relevant. It's very relevant to Nairobi, actually. Um, so when you look at New York, you can look at New York, but New York really isn't relevant. New York is, you know, one of the largest cities in the world. There are a, a number of other cases in the United States, and this, I think, is the, is the best one. So Denver sits in the middle of a region that has these mountains over here where people ski, where people have, there are resorts, there is nature, there is outdoor uh, recreation. What is, in, in Kenya, what would this be comparable to, these mountains over here? What's the direct parallel in Kenya? CBD. No, no, I mean those mountains behind the city. Oh, safari, this whole safari country, yeah. right? You have a world-class, you have the world-class safari area, arguably in the world. You have the most important destination for tourism, for uh, recreation. You attract the entire international uh, tourism community to your safari country. No, no question, right? So when you look at these two cases, I think you really wonder, this is the American world-class resort and recreation area. And Denver sits right next to it, like Nairobi. So there's a large region in which the periphery is about recreation, outdoor sports, nature, and in the middle is this very similar actually city. This is actually, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of comparisons. So here we have a lot of people think of Colorado as just being focused on nature, hiking, sports, etc. But in fact, as I was mentioning yesterday and when we were talking about high-tech startups, the top 10 metro areas for high-tech startup density this was uh, last. This was two years ago. This, or I think it was last year. This this study was done, and this was based on data collected in 2010. Here is Colorado. Four 
of the top 10 metro areas for high tech startup density are in Boulder, Fort Collins, Denver, and Colorado Springs right here. So what we're seeing is, first of all, the similarity is that there is this amazing, beautiful, large region with a city in the middle. There is already a very strong tech startup uh, in, uh, inertia, initiative, if you will, impetus, which is something that you're thinking about pursuing. And there is a very strong urban revitalization. This is Denver. Uh, we're going to talk about this case study, which is Denver Union Station and its development in the context of Denver with a thriving uh, public realm. This happens to be the, the center of the city, the 16th Street Mall, which is a, uh, which has a light, which has a uh, circulator bus. This is one of those free buses that circulates through the city. People can jump on, jump off at will. But this is a very lively uh, retail space with a new convention center, it's a major convention hub, and a beautiful new art museum. Very cultural, very uh, thriving city. So Denver and Nairobi are similar, and by the way, I really want to stress that this is one scenario, this is one example of many. You have to take away uh, lessons from all of these cases. Um, but just as an aside, Denver and Nairobi are sister cities. There's a Nairobi park in Denver, by the way. But it's at the heart of a big nature tourism region. At the same time, it's quite urban. They have historic hearts, historic centers, and sprawling metropolitan areas. And this is really also a key to this case study. How did Denver, like Nairobi, which is sprawling, and in which people are using cars and automobiles, how did they rein in this problem? How did they get it under control? Which is what you're trying to do right now with your public transport system, okay? So this is exactly the same problem that, that is, uh, Denver has tackled. The downtowns have a similar uh, architectural style in a way. And what's important here, because we're going to be talking about process. Um, there are similar cultural styles. This. In Colorado, if you remember, what, I don't know if you remember, but what is the iconic personality of the western part of the United States? The cowboy. The independent person who wants to make their own decisions, who doesn't want to be controlled by government. The person who wants to be able to say, this is my land, nobody can tell me what to do with it. So you have a very similar sort of challenge that these people, historically, these are the, you know, this is the West, the people who left the East Coast of the United States and went to the West and wanted to have their independence. How do you corral them all together? How do you bring them together under that, with that kind of personality? They all want their own land, and land is a very strong issue. And how do you get a project like this to happen given that, that sort of situation? Now, in uh, about uh, 10 years ago, the, the government and the people of the region realized that they needed to get the suburban sprawl under control. The city was very polluted with, uh, because of transport, because of uh, automobile traffic. It wasn't as congested as it was polluted. And they initiated this uh, public transport system, which included uh, light rail, commuter rail, BRT, 57 new transit stations, bus rail connections, park and rides, et cetera, et cetera. The whole sort of group of public transport systems that we're uh, undertaking now in Nairobi. And at the heart of this, of course, was the challenge of what to do with the uh, existing Union Station, which another historic building, and the center of the city, which had the historic uh, set of tracks here, and at the edge of the, the urban, the main urban area is over here, and this is at the edge, just like Nairobi. I mean, it almost looks exactly like Nairobi in a lot of these steps. And so this was, the, this is the Union Station. The challenge is how to deal with suburban sprawl, creating an integrated public transport hub, redevelopment, integrating this uh, historic building, but, but looking forward in terms of the modern idea and catalyzing and linking to the surrounding city. I think the one thing that became very clear is that a station is not just a project in and of itself. It has to be a catalytic project that will really enrich and enliven and redevelop the entire city. 
We don't want this to just be a project on its own. We want, as Rose rightly points out, this is going to have an impact and influence and will interface with the entire city. And so uh, this is a classic sort of simple land use plan of how all of these functions were integrated uh, with the entertainment and uh, district, the retail district, commuter rail, regional retail, uh, neighborhood retail, the bus, the light rail, all sort of beginning to be integrated into one project, which is kind of a very simple layout here of all the functions that would then come to play as the project unfolded. But the key here is that this was not seen as just a separate project, but part of the overall fabric of the city. So ultimately, the end result was a project in which there was a very modern station, and you'll see more of this, that was uh, integrated together with the historic structure. And the idea being that this is a multimodal TOD hub uh, Fun, uh, based on financing public-private development, uh, and it really starts to say, make a very strong statement about the vision of the city and how much they care about integrated uh, TOD, integrated public-private transport. So this was not uh, an, a short process. This was a fairly long process. Uh, and what we're going to do today is we're going to see a little uh, video about the process of bringing together all of the different actors. What's really important in this particular case is not the numbers. We're not going to crunch numbers so much today in this, in this study. What we're going to do is look at and listen to people, all the people like yourselves, the day before this opened or the week before this project opened for its grand opening. They're going to tell the story of how they put this project together. And this is very important for you because they, this is not 100 years after the project is done. This is not 20 years after the project done. This is the week before the project opens. And they're looking back and they're saying, this is what we had to do to accomplish this. So in the video, you're going to see a lot of pictures. Oh, thank you. You're going to see a lot of pictures of the station. People, there's, people aren't using it yet. Okay, it's right, it's, it's the week before the launch. And so this is meant to be a video to share with you the, the story of bringing together a collaborative group of people, how difficult and challenging it was, and at the same time, how they managed uh, to accomplish it. And I think the takeaway here is to focus on their story and how they managed to do this and to think about how they all had different interests and different concerns but they came together uh, to, uh, they came together. Now, let's see here. Oops. No, no, it's okay. It's just the uh, oh, yeah. okay. new courses here. So. We're also going to see a lot of construction video, in progress construction, for the engineers here will like that. Downtown's already a very vibrant place, but what you do with bringing Union Station back to life is really giving back its, its heart. This is the new symbol for transportation and connecting people and our economic vitality within Colorado. It's a great story. Great story of what we all do together. When I see Union Station, I see the soul of the city. During its heyday, this place had 80 trains a day going through here. It said, welcome, welcome to Denver. And this place had the power to change lives. If you look back a hundred years ago, train activity at Union Station is what really made Denver what it is today. Union Station is the symbol of a city, progressive, dynamic, welcoming. But imagine this place is a shopping center or a convention center. Those are some of the ideas that came up when rail traffic was in decline. Or I could even be standing underwater here in Lake Denver. That was one of the plans. Fortunately, 
urban planners had a better idea for Union Station. It was the perfect location for the intermodal uh, hub, for light rail, commuter rail buses. There was no place else in the region where it would work. And it was actually being talked about to be purchased by a private sector group. And if they had developed it, it would have been lost as a transportation. It ended up being a public private. So it became a real sense of urgency to, to get control so we could use it for its intended purpose, which was a transit center. Fast tracks is delivering six rail quarters, 122 miles of commuter and light rail, nearly 20 miles of bus rapid transit, lots of new parking, 57 new stations that have transit urban communities all around it. It is the hub for fast tracks. Doing the station is that integral key piece of fast tracks. Just every line that we have for fast tracks is going to go through doing the station. Historic buildings are always the best if they're being used for their original function. Right? When you have a historic building and, and bring it back to its original function, it's just it's almost sweeter. When we began, we really sat around the room and I asked ourselves what we had a project. And you can imagine with a committee of 99 people from yeah, all kinds of people. Uh, uh, quite a lot of people in the towns. Uh, it was really a broad swath of people that looked at what the idea could be. Eventually, someone comes forward and says, now, where are all the ideas? We need to put this down, we need to put this together in a master plan. To make the project work financially, that the real city needs to be viable, that the development needs to be viable. By taking infrastructure, moving it through the neighborhood, to create opportunities for new retail development as the community helps, and you know that generates tax revenue, and it's what drives everything. And we really believe that this plan would activate more of the neighborhood and, and extend the amenity to more real estate, and. The real estate taxes generated by the development around the project were, in fact, one of the principal mechanisms through which the project is funded. That was this. We'll talk about this. The idea of real estate value capture. Very, very unique. Particularly along the roof wall, uh, those two are, as far as I know, the only project in the country where we use or combine those two own uh, products. And this three-legged financing school, the private sector, federal uh, assistance, and of course local sales tax revenue in our case, this three-legged financing school is so huge. Uh, I believe this is what this is the way mega projects will be built in this country uh, from here on out. This spell was created by the Denver City Council. We were the engine, you know, to make the project become a reality. And we had to be all in, whether it was reorganizing the budget, um, hiring a project manager. I mean, every, every mountain became, became a, uh, a hurdle that we went through, you know, one after another and after another. And we just started gaining momentum. And that synergy between all the partners, both from the private and public sectors, really kept us going. advance in our progress of the transit facilities, the developers came on board, not just one, but I think we were up to about 15 in the general facility. And all of the developers had to work together. It took a lot of coordination, and each individual development had their own schedule. So we tried to make all the schedules work. Originally, we broke the scope down into five discernible elements. Light rail station, underground bus terminal, near rail terminal, all of the streets, and then the separate last piece was for the plaza improvements. When you try to build a job this big in a time frame you're getting, you have to be able to slide people in and out of roles. Some people that were working as part of plaza projects began to work as part of the bus terminal projects, and at the end of the day, that helped that flexibility help us finish the job on time. When people think of innovation, they think of trains. That's been the history of this place. But it turns out that you can teach 
an old station, new tracks. This is the new bus concourse at Union Station. There are 22 gates designed for easy connections to light rail, commuter rail, and track, all in the same building. The great thing about the new Union Station is that it provides a link for all sorts of uh, transit forms, whether it's commuter rail, or light rail, or buses. Uh, you won't be able to use the Union Station on any of the future. It's going to be flexible enough to transform itself over the, the decades as uh, technology changes with transportation.
No, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. So, you know, okay, let's get back on track and do it. I think that's what's so amazing about what they're going to do. Would you think of all the people who have passed through the Union Station since 1881, that's a lot of history. Of course, transportation has changed since then, from horse-drawn streetcar to electric railways to buses to light rail. And through it all, here sat Union Station, a grand old landmark awaiting a new vision. It was clear that the station was very important to the citizens of Denver. This was true collaboration at its finest that would benefit the public for future generations. New Station is a second chance to really contribute to the heart and soul and the vitality and the sustainability of our great city. You know, the different communities, and if they're all going to work together, right, and, and create something like fast tracks, businesses, when they're looking where to go, they go, wow, I don't see that anywhere else in the United States. Okay, so, and last, well, just the latest Business Insider economic study ranks Colorado as the um, fastest growing state in the United States for 2014. So there's positive impacts from this kind of approach and this kind of collaboration and attitude that is reflected in economic development. Since uh, we only have about a couple more minutes, I'm just going to quickly summarize the, the rest of this. Um, so obviously all of these projects have a similar focus on integrating with the community, transportation, infrastructure functioning, uh, trying to influence the local economy uh, by integrating into it, and of course the real estate development. And um, the structure of this is similar. Is one example. It's similar to others with a uh, project authority. It's happening to be the Denver Union Station Project Authority, which was the overarching uh, agency that was created, managing the construction contractor, and then a master developer. So this is infrastructure uh, co uh, construction, master developer of all the real estate <coughs> the project, and then with all the project, government project partners, uh, there were even more, but these were the key comparable to your uh, KRC, Nairobi, City County, uh, Nairobi Metro, et cetera, government agency. So uh, there were some legal changes that need to, needed to be made in order to uh, manage the finance and the legal issues, and those were not trivial, and those were addressed up front, and those had to be hammered out. Uh, financing was uh, basically, uh, this looks complicated, but the simple story is, is that there were government grants, straight out government grants that were accessed. And by the way, one of the government grants was from Homeland Security. The Department of Defense gave some funds to this project. And so you should look, you should consider all the different options for different kinds of government funds. Land sales, the land in the project was sold to private developers and that was $40 million. Government loans, I'll come back to this in a minute, 300 million and other funds, 80 billion. It's about a $500 million project initially. Now what's most important, government loans, the government did not just give the project money. This could be municipal uh, uh, authority loans like we talked about the other day. It could be a variety of different sources. But the basic principle here that I want to just kind of point out to you is that in the beginning, if you get your loans, your funding, your bonds, whatever it is, sources X, Y, Z, you have to pay back those loans. And so the key principle that Marco was explaining very nicely with his site planning, and I'm explaining this, this concept, is basically that over time, let's say from year one to the end of the payback of the loan, this could be 30, 20 years or whatever, you have, you build real estate, and every year you build more and more real estate. So these are buildings, if you will, right? And if you just, if you structure your tax system so that taxes go up, 
with the more real estate you build, property taxes, you can say, you can agree, we will allocate a certain percentage of those new tax revenues to pay off the bond. Okay? That's called tax increment financing. In the United States, it's called different things in different places. It happens to be TIF in the United States. In 1982, we had to change the state law in order to allow this. It was not an easy thing. I'll be honest, I was there when we did that. And what's interesting is, is that this amount of money, let's say this is $300 million over time, it's capitalized, the net present value is the $300 million that you have to pay off. But after you pay that off, in perpetuity, this will go to the government to the city, to the whichever government you decide, entity. And in the future, this will be used for whatever, whatever activities the government wants to apply it to. So remember that there's a double benefit. Not only do you get this project, but in the future, through into the future, that real estate tax goes to the government. Okay, so it's a very, that's how, in some ways how it's catalytic. Um, so what else do we have here? So this is, these are the loan repayment sources and they, and as I said, uh, uh, here we are, this is, this is the tax increment financing and through these sources. The, de the various authorities had to be created in order to legally do that. I'm not going to go through this right now. So bottom line, I think, uh, the, the key takeaway on this project is that tax increment financing was a very important part of the mechanism. The collaborative effort that was required in order to make this happen was not trivial, but when you get a group of independent people all having their own interests who decide for the sake of their city and their region and for the very practical outcomes. Let's, let's be very clear. This is a very important outcome, that they could come together under the circumstances to create a beautiful urban space in the middle of a region that was focused on nature and tourism and recreation as Nairobi is. That nowadays people love a balance, they love that nature, they love that beautiful, their, uh, their farm up country, but they also love a beautiful city. And that's what's interesting about this, is to, the way that this, this group of people came together to create that. So, thank you. Thank you.